Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Master Talk from Design Wire. Uh, today we are very honored to have David Rockwell to join us. Uh, David is a great interior designer. Uh, he, he has done a great amount of de uh, designs for many different types, uh, including real estate, hotel, uh, retail, and even stage design. Uh, and our Master Talk program is a, a program targeting to the world-class masters. Uh, we've talked to the founder of Aman, the, the um, Adrian Daka, and also Yabu Pushelberg, uh, Bill Bensley, uh, Peter Eisenman, and uh, Tihani Design. So let's welcome David Rockwell again. Thank you, very nice to be here. <laughs> Okay, David, it's very, uh, it's very nice to talk to you. Um, so we know you have, uh, you moved from Mexico to the United States uh, when you were uh, young. So um, is there any influence on your design for growing up in different cultures? There, there's no question that, um, that that heavily influenced me in a couple of key ways. One is, I think, movement and living in different places um, uh, got me interested in travel. It also, um, at an early age, um, sort of set in motion uh, lots of work and research around things that change and move. I think being a, a kid who was always on the move for a whole bunch of reasons, um, that, that sense of transition and newness um, was very exciting to me, and I think I became kind of a student of that. The second reason that that move to Guadalajara, Mexico is so significant is um, I had been living in a very uh, beautiful, very private suburb in New Jersey that was all public, uh, all private space, big homes, uh, there was a beautiful beach, but lives were lived in big private homes. And in Guadalajara, Mexico, I went to a city that was all public space, even, even down to uh, all of the rituals of everyday life take place in marketplaces and bull rings and uh, in wider streets. So I think uh, my interest as a kid in New York was in theater and in moving to Mexico, I fell totally in love with quality of light, sense of spectacle, urban theater. Uh, so it introduced me to a number of um, things that had been very influential in, in my career. I would say light, use of light and, uh, and kind of uh, materiality are the key elements I took from, from Mexico. That's very uh, interesting experience, um, and we uh, and we also know that you've done uh, lots of different types of projects. So, um, what design methods uh, you use to meet changes with constancy? Um, it's an interesting question, and I think that uh, I think I find in my studio finds new challenges the lifeblood of our work. Um, and so even if it's a project type we've done a lot of, for instance, a restaurant, which over 35 years, that kind of began our studio, we find something about the owner, the location, the narrative, the cuisine uh, that pushes us in a new direction. Uh, so I think um, starting with research, starting by understanding um, you have to be willing to give you and your team permission to come up with some ideas that won't work um, and a drive to um, to invent i think we're very interested in invention so that that um that in some ways pulls and pushes us into new project types and it it really is the at the core of i think what makes rockwell group rockwell group so I like to know the client first and then do the invention, right? Yes, yes, you have to do a lot of research and, uh, and you sort of surround yourself with all of the conditions of the project. And then you try to think of um, 
how do you uh, solve that problem in an unexpected way? How can you combine uh, things that are familiar and have emotional buy-in to uh, a participant or an audience member? And, and I think the word audience, both in architecture and theater, is, is very important to me and to us because we do think buildings at the end of the day are experienced from the inside out. And as well as interior design, we do architecture, so we do ground up buildings. Um, but our, our, uh, our core constituency is uh, the audience, the people who experience uh, the building or the place. Okay, so is there anything else you want to challenge uh, for the next step? What do I see as the next challenges coming up? Is that the question? Yes. Well, you know, let's just start with the fact that um, every conversation or interview we're doing now is virtual. You know, we're we're living in a in a, a time of this pandemic that um, that I think, among other things, and other you know really devastating effects to the to the planet, um, it has uh, made communication be essentially virtual. And I think what makes cities great is that you're able to have non-virtual uh, uh, conversations. And in fact, you're rubbing up against different people all the time. And I think that friction uh, is what creates sort of um, spontaneous solutions and makes cities so vital and makes New York so great. So I think we're living in a time of enormous challenges for, for everyone. and. Um, uh, as designers, we are inherently optimistic in that we're thinking of solutions. We're trying to think of how to look at the future from a design point of view. And one of the things I'm intrigued by is flexibility. I've always loved flexible things. I love things that move. Um, I, I love buildings that can move and change, which is a sort of link with sets. But I think there's going to be a new challenge to create spaces that... Um, that will accommodate whatever the new uh, norm will be. Uh, and that can, in fact, uh, nothing can be future-proofed, but I think looking at how, um, take one example, restaurants, where this pandemic has exposed what a um, thin business model that was, even when it was successful in New York, profit margins were small, restaurants were still struggling. Um, I think thinking about the landlord restaurant relationship and as an architect, can we find a way to help an owner use the space throughout the day, throughout the week? Can it also be used for cooking classes? Can it be used for community activities? So I think thinking about how spaces can combine more than one use, be flexible and learn from the past is a, is a very big new challenge that architects and designers have in front of them now. Yeah, exactly. Flexibility is very important, especially for the times like now. Okay, so um, let's talk about uh, your projects. I think we can talk about your real estate projects first. Great. Um, so um, we noticed that the waterline projects is the one you just finished. So um, can you share the inspiration of that design with us? I would love to. I would love to, yeah. Um, so the Waterline project was uh, un it's totally unprecedented for us. Um, well, let me start by saying Waterline was unlike any project we had, we had been offered or seen before in that it, it is 100,000 square feet of amenities. And that's over three times the size of any amenity um, package I know of in New York. And it's an area where we've done quite a bit of work. We've worked in creating residential buildings, um, creating just the amenities or the apartments. So we're interested in changing our focus from space to space. Here, Waterline is uh, three towers, three separate buildings, all notable pieces of architecture that each had um, space underground for an amenity, an amenity group called Waterline Club. We started to work on it and um, realized this was actually an opportunity to create a, a kind of center, like almost a nexus, the heartbeat of 
these three disparate buildings. So we proposed um, connecting all three uh, amenity package into this super package. And then this space that you're looking at is really more akin to um, walking around a park, walking around the reservoir at Central Park. The idea of meandering and using choreography is a way to introduce people to the space and give them a view of everything happening around it. So you see this uh, wood bridge that's sort of an infinity shape that connects all three levels. And you enter at the mid-level and you enter and see this space and around the, what looks like a courtyard, the travertine wall, all of those punched openings have all of the spaces you might see as you move through this building. So it gives you a chance to see all of the things you might want to try and do if you were to live here. Um, so it is, it was a total labor of love. And the only way we could um, begin this was this whole series of models for the client where we proposed different program elements, things that were for fitness, a tennis court, soccer, a racquetball, a big gym, but also things for the creative side of your brain, um, a music studio, uh, art studio, uh, hydroponic gardens. I think we have images of some of the other spaces here. So this shows uh, just four of them. It shows the music studio, uh, which is my favorite room. Uh, in the last four years, I started playing piano a lot. Again, I played as a kid, but that's been a, a new um, hobby for me. And you see the art studio, uh, a basketball court and swimming pool. And the biggest challenge for this was there's no natural light. We were all underground. So uh, it's one of the reasons why we created a glowing ceiling for all of these spaces that would change color temperature based on time of day. So it's full spectrum white, but it can go from warm white to cool white. Okay, so uh, we, uh, we noticed that um, the design of the projects has a very unique ceiling um, and also uh, there's lots of woods. So if there's any um, challenges during the construction, uh, during the construction phase and how did yeah. you solve it? One of the biggest uh, challenges was thinking about these bridge structures. We wanted them to feel like they were sort of stretched. You can see they get a little bit thinner in the middle and they feel like they were sort of stretched. And um, as we started to think about who would make these, we went to a yacht builder because they have the experience of have using wood in movement. So it feels kinetic. Uh, that was a big challenge and a big commitment for the owner to sign on to that. The ceiling uh, was a particular challenge because we wanted to create a glowing ceiling, but we didn't want to see the light sources. We didn't want to see the up lights or the down lights. So these uh, metal uh, and fiberglass fins that are supported by the columns, at the top each has a piece of LED uh, that glows off of the ceiling and creates what feels like a continuous sunlit ceiling. So those were the two biggest challenges construction wise on this. Yeah, that's a very unique design. Yeah. Uh, there's another uh, very remarkable project, uh, the 550 Medicine. Uh, yes. We have to talk about that. So uh, we know that uh, you wanted to lead the um, public the uh, community lifestyle by the public area design. So can you talk with us, uh, how did you achieve it? I can't, you know, it's, a, it's such a great building. And um, as an office building, it's now being reconceived of as super luxury. And um, in the world of super luxury, I think there's so many interesting opportunities to, uh, to do things that aren't expected. This is the central space in, uh, in Philip Johnson's original building. And as you may know, many of the details are being maintained and restored. We're looking at the murals by Dorothea Rockburn on either side, who when Sony occupied the building in the 90s, did this work. So we're keeping that, but we're framing that with uh, a kind of bridge structure 
that allows you to get closer up to that round window. And then in this case, all that custom light fixture mobile, the banquettes and the, the desks around the side have two very different modes. They have the daytime mode, but they also have a nighttime mode when this space would be used for entertaining. Uh, so uh, the amenities are um, super high-end, uh, but very simple dining. Uh, if you go to the next image, you'll see one of the spaces off of this main space. So here again, we're getting very close to the view and looking at that, uh, looking at that facade. And uh, this is a dining room that will be open um, all the time with a kind of grab and go that's right off of that lobby. So like a club, a private club, but you would have your office there. And it means you can use your office uh, and not put all of these amenities in that space. And think of this as sort of your built-in club. Yeah, so this is the living room. Uh, and one of the things that that is a this kind of uh, condition of this building is, you know, sometimes you walk into a, a lobby or a hotel and it feels like the first group of people that sit down take over the space. So we're very much thinking this is separate spaces. Um, they're almost residential scale, the amenities. Very grand residential, but there's pockets for many groups of people to share this space. So um, you've talked about the uh, public areas of five di uh, 550 Medicine Project. Uh, so can you share with us uh, what do you think should be the focus when designing a public areas? Um, I think the focus should be on developing a unique point of view. I think, I think flexibility sometimes can mean neutral. That in order to be flexible, you have to be neutral. And um, I don't believe that's true. I think uh, creating a distinct point of view and a distinct personality that then allows every design decision to not be arbitrary, that it's all part of creating a, a kind of idea or mood that is particular to that project. So um, you talk about flexibility. Um, so what, do, uh, what kind of lifestyle do you think um, the design could be led? Um, well, I think it's uh, a lifestyle that would mean, um, you know, not, it, you, if you imagine there may be more people in the future continuing to work at home, I think we've seen an explosion of that and that's not gonna go away. Part of the lifestyle of working is gonna be, what are you gonna do there that you can't do at home? How can you collaborate? How can you create uh, opportunities for people to, to, uh, to do the things you can't do in your own space? So that was really, that was the point of view here from the beginning, even pre-pandemic. Um, because I do think, one of the great luxuries when we think about a luxury office space is uh, a space that um, gives you back time during the day. You know, the ultimate luxury is time. So I think having all of these connected amenities in a resident, in a office building or a residential building, like in Waterline, in some ways gives you back time uh, to, for your life. Okay. So, uh, um, I think we can talk about hotel design. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And take the uh, Equinox Hotel for an example. Um, we know all of the hotel design you've done have their very unique concept. And Equinox is the concept focus on fitness. Um, so do we have the next, do we have the, is the next image Equinox here? It's, Equinox was kind of amazing because we've known about the health club as it built its legend in New York. Uh, and so I was surprised when they came to us and said, we, you know, can you help us develop a hotel idea? Okay, so, um, and uh, we know that Equinox is a hotel that uh, focuses on the fitness, uh, fitness concept. Um, so how does the design reinforce the concept and uh, the several functions? Um, 
so in any project you have to start by studying the client as i said and and one of the things about equinox i found so amazing is their loyal client base more and more looks at them for uh for more and more things so they started creating juice bars lounges classes uh soul cycle became a part of the equinox family um, and in the hotel space uh we felt that the luxury hotel market didn't have a clear uh, hotel option that really looked at the balance of daytime and nighttime. The balance of both uh, where you might work out, but where you might recharge. You know, what's the other side of fitness, uh, relaxation. And, and so um, very contemporary materials, much like Equinox's a vocabulary but all of the forms are built around uh, fluidity and uh, transition so this idea of how do you create a place to have an active lifestyle and recharge led to um, uh, kind of our point of view so here you're seeing the main reception area which is quite small but it overlooks the restaurant and the restaurant is 24 7 an extension of the lobby I think maybe the next image shows the restaurant. Yeah, so here we're just looking over that balcony and um, you can see it's broken up into smaller discrete spaces, but that bar, for instance, three-sided bar that has a spectacular view, all of those vertical liquor risers during the day rotate and in the back or chalkboard and it's a juice bar during the day. The fireplace is two-sided, and at night on the other side, there's a dining room that opens up. So uh, I think it, it uh, you know, attempts to uh, fill an interesting place in the hotel world. Uh, it attempts to fill an interesting space in the hotel world by, by being, you know, nimble and useful day and night, and, and very much about movement. I think the next image is one of my favorite spaces there, and it's the outdoor terrace. So. The restaurant has this uh, outdoor terrace that allows outdoor dining and drinking a separate bar looking towards the Hudson River. Um, and it, uh, you know, it's one of those great projects where we had many years to think about it as I was a, a, a fan of Equinox long before we got to design this. So what is the uh, biggest uh, highlight for this project? Is this uh, outdoor uh, terrace? No, I think the biggest highlight is actually the rooms, because I think the rooms in some ways um, focus on recharging and they do things that you always want hotel rooms to do, but they don't always do, which is create the best possible condition for sleeping, custom bed, uh, a mechanical system that brings the temperature down to 65 unless you, 65 or 68 unless you manually change it. Um, very little furniture that it's all built in and sleek you can see the headboard becomes the banquette um, the uh, flat but upholstered tufted walls create incredible sound isolation so quality of light in there large wooden floor in front of the bed uh, with a custom yoga mat that is there for stretching and classes on the tv and then a bathroom that uh with uh glass that has an LCD component so it can become frosted, it can be either open to the bedroom or closed, and then a large changing area that feels like your own in-suite uh, changing room. So it's compact, but every square inch is engineered to be taut and very much about giving you a unique night's sleep. So the uh the uh, custom, uh, the custom experience is the most luxury things for the project. And, That's right. Yeah, and also uh, we've noticed that the uh, New York uh, Edition Hotel is another very uh, great and remarkable uh, project you've done. So can you yeah. talk about us? Uh, can you talk about it with us? Sure. Uh, the New York Edition is um, in the clock tower. I think we have an image of, yeah, there we go. So it's in a building called the Clock Tower, which is a national landmark. Beautiful, beautiful um, building on Madison Square. 
And our response to that was uh, we wanted to create an interior that was a classic New York residential interior um, and uh, not try and mimic the building, which is historic, but create a contemporary version of something that totally went with that building. Um, so there's a, a base of amenities at the bottom. There's a lobby and then a restaurant. And as I said, it's a classic uh, historic building. Um, our interiors are very contemporary and the way you get up to those amenities is through this uh, stair in the form of a helix that is a powder coated metal on the outside and walnut on the inside. So in some ways the stair expresses the fact that the hotel has a very different exterior than interior. You almost peel away the, the inner life of this building as you go up the stair. <laughs> okay, um, so I have next, uh, I have another question for this one. Um, yeah. So uh, we know when we talk about uh, East Coast, uh, we always think about a very cool and calm uh, color tone for it. But for the New York edition, it seems uh, like a very warm tone. So how did you um, fit the context for the design? It's a, it's a great question. Um, we thought about classic New York buildings like the Dakota, for instance, a legendary New York residential building. Um, and uh, we asked ourselves, what would a warm interior be like if it were if it were contemporary, but sat inside of one of those buildings? So, given the coolness of the exterior, um, we thought warm made sense. And one of the things we uncovered is the second floor restaurant, where the interiors are landmark, were all heavily detailed wood. So in some ways, our warm interiors uh, branch between that existing interior of the restaurant and the coolness of the building. Uh, so that, that was our way into coming up with a color palette. Okay, so um, I think- it's a, really, it's, a really, it's a really good question and a really good point. <laughs> and thank you for your uh, answer. So I think we've talked about uh, two hotel design projects and next let's talk about the restaurant because uh, we know that you've done lots of restaurants uh, in the beginning of your design career and also uh, the, uh, the fun part was our last talk was with Tihani and we also know he's done lots of restaurants. So when we uh, talk about restaurant design, uh, there's one point he mentioned was uh, very funny that he said, um, don't eat in a restaurant when you are starving because you will ignore the um, environment. So uh, we also wanted to talk uh, about the restaurant design with you. So uh, in your point of view, uh, what is the most important aspects for the restaurant design? I think the single most important aspect is to uh, work with the owner and the chef to uh, have a point of view that acknowledges what they want to do service wise, what they want to do food wise. I think the most significant um, impact an architect has on a restaurant actually is not all the things you see. I think it's the layout. I think it's how the restaurant unfolds, what your first view in is, um, very invisible things like the relationship of the kitchen to the dining room. Um, how do you design a dining room where there are no bad areas that you don't want to see? So I think it's the, it's the planning and uh, all, of, all of what goes into understanding that, that point of view. One perfect example to think about is a chair in a restaurant or a banquette, right? That, that's your most personal relationship with the restaurant, the thing you're touching and sitting on and uh, understanding from a restaurant tour how long a dining experience is, what's the quality of light that you want on the table. So there's all of these things that you do 
that set the conditions for what the experience is like. Do we have some restaurant images to look at? Yeah, we can talk about dine out quickly. Great. So, um, so you know, as you mentioned, we've done restaurants for 35 years in New York. It's how my studio began. Um, and I think, you know, you go to a city to experience new things and New York is always reinventing itself. The ground floor is constantly churning with invention as are all major cities. And when, uh, when restaurants shut down in New York, uh, I started to talk to restaurateurs and friends of mine about when they reopen, what is it that is going to make them start to feel safe? What's going to make them physically safe? What's going to make them emotionally safe? What's going to make people want to leave their homes and eat. And of course, outdoors became an interesting canvas. So uh, really in mid-April, early on, I um, reached out to a few people, including Melba Wilson, who's an amazing restaurateur in Harlem. And we started to develop ideas about how could we help restaurants open outside? Well, we need to come up with uh, a ground plan, start to develop ideas. So we developed 40 or 50 different ideas. We engaged with New York City. We um, spoke to the Department of Transportation, the police department, restaurateurs around the country. And we created a really simple kit of parts and then uh, actually initiated a non-for-profit called Dine Out, raised money, and uh, developed a way to do outdoor dining originally in individual restaurants but then in communities, this is showing Chinatown and this installation where the city allows the street to close off has nine different restaurants that all participate in, in this. And it, it goes to what I was saying about the question of what's the most important part of a restaurant. Um, you know, it's all important, but the, the architect and designer's work begins long before what you see and more about offering solutions, creative solutions. So here the solution was taking the parking lane, finding a safe way to eat, uh, and then finding a way to break down the scale so socially distance was built in. And then layering on top of that, how to have it be a community art project. So we worked with a, a local school and teachers and children from the school who created these, and, and two significant local artists to create the artwork as well. So. When you look at this, you don't see uh, the level of design you might see in a Nobu, but the level of thought is uh, equally um, uh, important and, and sort of analytic and, and again, um, helps create opportunities for people. Design is a way to solve problems, I guess. Yeah, um, to help restaurant reopen is really a uh, main uh, issue and problems that we, we are facing for the current situation. And this solution uh, is a very smart uh, way to help them. And also talk about restaurant design from you that yeah. We know that uh, you are uh, cooperate with Noble Re uh, Restaurant for years. Um, so uh, when you designed for it, how did you express this brand concept? Um, well, Nobu was a breakthrough project for us and for me. And in 94, when we did the first Nobu, um, I actually had tasted uh, Nobu Matsuhisa's food at a uh, benefit for Meals on Wheels, uh, where he came over to cook. Uh, I think that was 92, and food was amazing. Uh, I had been in business about six years, uh, and I said, if you ever come to New York, we'd love to design your restaurant. And uh, I do think Nobu's <clears throat> point of view to food and service was revolutionary in, in, in it when it began, starting with the fact that uh, there were really no three-star restaurants without tablecloths. So, it looked at luxury as uh, a much more, I think, uh, contemporary, modern experience. And also, as I started to research uh, Nobu and talk to him about his amazing approach to food, I began to understand his combination of Peruvian tastes and Japanese flavors, that combination. Um, 
so we we created a a, a restaurant that that em, embraced all of that and embraced his sense of hospitality drew Naporant, mayor tepper and robert de niro were the other partners each one had a big impact um and then it began a you know amazing long relationship over these many years designing lots and lots of restaurants and now hotels for them and i'm very grateful it's one of the rare things as an architect to have a a 25 year experience continuing to to develop wow that's a very remarkable experience and uh for all of these noble projects uh which one or which design is the most remarkable one for you oh you want me to pick my favorite child yes <laughs> uh well i'm gonna name three uh the middle bar on the right is nobu 57th street in new york which was about 10 or 15 years after the original nobu uh and there were many things about that that were phenomenal for for me as a designer and one of them was how difficult the space was it was a small ground floor space and then all of the second floor space it was only uh, a little over three meters tall three and a half meters tall so it was an enormous challenge, but challenges, I do think designs benefit from challenges. You know, we benefit from compression. The other example I'm going to name had very little compression um, because it was the only ground up Nobu. And it's at the top in the middle in Doha. And it sits on a peninsula off of the Four Seasons. And it's a, a stone wrapper of an exterior and it's a freestanding Nobu. And one of the original elements in the very first Nobu was using river rocks to create an abstraction of nature. One of the things that was so clear with Nobu is uh, it was not typical Japanese cuisine and we wanted to create an interior that uh, also was in some ways not so expected. And using river rocks as a way to create these simple planes that represented water here and there we got to do it on the outside. Third example I think is coming up next, and it's the most recent Nobu, uh, Nobu Downtown. So Nobu Downtown um, is in the original AT&T building. So it's a beautiful landmark space that had a number of uh, challenges. One is, it's a landmark space, we couldn't do much above eight feet. So all of the furniture glows all of the furniture has lighting in it and it's all removable everything you see here sits and plugs in every piece of it so as a landmark it doesn't damage the building and then i got to collaborate and commission uh, a wood craftsman named john hushman wood artist craftsman to create what you're seeing above the bar um, and it's made out of scorched ash which is what the tables in the first Nobu were in 94, in every Nobu sense. But that scorched ash uh, is used as very thin warped wood, almost like calligraphy. If you were to do calligraphy in water, it floats above and it swoops around and connects to downstairs because this is just the bar. The main restaurant, for some reason, I guess we get a lot of projects with no daylight, is, uh, has no daylight as well like Waterline. So that leads you down to the main restaurant, which has a ceiling uh, made out of wood that feels like um, a kind of origami that's cut open. And, um, and in the background, you see those four abstracted trees, which the original Nobu 94 had as well. Um, so this was you know, a great gift to be able to work with this group again and uh, kind of reestablish a New York new home for them yeah this design is is just so remarkable and very unique especially for the artwork about the uh, bar and yeah and also in the background on the right you see all the sake bottles yes those were commissioned by uh, uh montreal ceramicist uh, pascal girardin and my daughter and i went to Montreal and actually did some of the original calligraphy marks that they then followed. So we got to get hands on here. 
That's so uh, sweet. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and we know that Novo has uh, its footprints all over the world. Uh, yep. So it has uh, branches in New York, and also it has the branches in Beijing and Shanghai in China. So yep. when you design different uh, branches for a different location, um, how do you do design uh, for the um, context? Like how, uh, how can you use the different design elements to fit the context? Are the next images Nobu Barcelona, which just opened up? Yeah. Let's scroll to those. Uh, so Nobu Barcelona, the best way to, to answer that is, as I said, the first part of designing a restaurant is figuring out the layout. You have to understand what's special about the space. How do you use that space in the most effective way? So that is totally unique, that problem solving uh, element. And in every case, uh, we'll find um, ways to relate to uh, local cultural um, habits, local artists, uh, local art inspirations. Um, an example in, Lo in uh, Nobu, Barcelona is, um, I've always been a huge fan of Antonio Gaudí and his work in Barcelona. And um, I had spent some time there looking at his work as a student. And Parque Guell has this amazing use of cracked tile. And uh, there is a Japanese traditional use of tile called Kantsugi, which uh, takes cracked pottery and uses dust and powders to meld it together. So we thought that that central element of um, beautiful, pristine materials that could be sort of cracked, like an eggshell or like, like Gaudi's tile, might be a through line through the hotel. Here we're seeing a, a larger scale a piece on the ceiling interpreted in wood, but even in the rooms uh, where um, every Nobu hotel has a certain elements in the room that are consistent. One is the headboard becoming the end tables, kind of minimal use of furniture, a um, handmade carpet right underneath the bed. And in this case, uh, an artist created these glazed ceramic pieces that we use as headboard art. Uh, so they all relate to a family of Nobu and a, a unique point of view but they try and solve the problem based on the space we're given and, and trying to find local cultural influences as well. So uh, when you design for uh, like other locations other than Asia, um, you know Nobu has its own Asian style of like or own Asian touch. So when you design in like European or um, America, do you think you should keep the uh, Asian touch or you should uh, consider more about the uh, East, uh, Western or let's say uh, Western contemporary design style? Well, I, I think in some ways um, Nobu Hotel has grown out of a point of view that's uh, East, Eastern rigor and in some cases Western comfort. So level of upholstery, um, those kinds of things are influenced by, um, I think, level of comfort. But I think that what makes Nobu so unique is it's all based on um, uh, Nobu and his team's point of view about food, which let's take, for instance, their use of elaborate wrappers beautiful presentation, but simple ingredients. Well, that's a powerful design brief, simple ingredients, but used in sort of beautiful ways. Or um, one of the things from the very first Nobu that was significant is when you sit down at the table, there are no placemats, there's no centerpiece, scorched wood, and your focus is totally on the food. So that is a, an element we take to all the designs. So I think we try and, track it all to something that is uniquely Nobu um, and transform that either way for its, uh, its location. 
Yeah, with a very elegant solution for design. Yeah. Okay, so we we know that uh, uh, besides the restaurant, um, hotel, and real estate projects, you've also done uh, some stage design projects. Yeah. So yeah, that's very uh, unique experience. So as an uh, expert in the, uh, a stage design, uh, you worked on the uh, lots of like um, famous stage play. So in your opinion, uh, what is the key for the stage design? Well, one of the keys I think is not thinking of yourself as an expert. <laughs> I, think, I think thinking of yourself as a student uh, is really important. The first time I was asked to speak at a conference called the TED Conference, um, uh, the curator of the conference said, uh, speak about something you're an amateur at. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, speak about something where you don't all know the answers right away. Think about something that's a passion. And, and so we are constantly, um, you know, reminding ourselves that uh, falling back into ways you've done things before doesn't really move you forward. Um, I've been interested in theater ever since I was a kid. I mentioned in, in, in New Jersey, my mom was part of a community theater uh, as I, grew as an architect, I was um, constantly working around people in the theater. And I always felt like in a piece of architecture or an interior, developing a clear narrative backstory. What is the script of the space? What is the life of the space? How do you define it? Um, always related to work in theater. I then studied theater and um, was lucky enough to to start to include this in the work we've done now. And we've done many, many theater sets and each one starts out by doing lots of research and then thinking about what is the world in which the story wants to take place? How do you, and it, the, the set is not the foreground, the set is the environment that helps the audience connect with the story. So, um, and I think that's one of the amazing things about theater is in, it's a live communal experience. And I think that uh, set designers have this very wonderful opportunity to look at the play, look at the music, talk to the director and create a world in which uh, that story can live and come to life. And in some ways, you don't wanna do the same thing the script is doing. Right, you want to provide a background to that. So uh, it's, it's been a great adventure. And I do think that the work we do in theater makes us better as architects. And I think the work we do in architecture makes us in some ways more fine tuned to the power of theater. Yeah, but how to connect, how to help the, uh, the drama to connect audience and the uh, stage, is this by the dramatic lighting or by uh, unique uh, stage design or something? All of the above. It's <laughs> by understand, it's by, I mean, part of it starts with understanding theaters about memory. So what are those images you create that are memorable and how do they support whatever the director wants to do? So on the bottom, second from the right, that's an image from Hairspray. <clears throat> and in Hairspray, the story uh, takes a turn when Tracy Turnblad talks to her mother about going on this TV show and they sing a song called Welcome to the 60s that introduces the world of possibilities and optimism of the 60s. And at that point in the show, this light bright wall, a wall of lights that's inspired by actually a, a toy from the 60s uh, is first revealed. So the emotion of the moment is augmented by the set. If you look at, uh, on the far left on the bottom, Kinky Boots, uh, the factory that's a place where the whole show takes place, when they begin to sing and dance, every part of that factory becomes something they can dance on and move. So you know, there's so many factors that go into creating a, something that functions for the actors and something that is able to capture those major theatrical moments and create uh, stage pictures that deepen your 
relationship to the story and create deep, deep memories. Okay, so uh, taking the Helen Highest Theater uh, that you designed as an example, uh, yeah. we know that uh, the times are changing and changing. So how um, how does the uh, how does this design adapt the changing times? Well, this project was one of the greatest gifts we've ever gotten to to renovate a Broadway theater. There's only 41 of them; they're all very special. And uh, in this case, we were renovating it for Second Stage, which is a theater group in New York, a non for profit that has a, a mission of presenting contemporary American playwrights. Um, and it was a, a theater from 1912. So you have a historic landmark presenting contemporary work. So our work was uh, in two major buckets. The first bucket was how to make it the highest functioning theater it could be. Air conditioning, lighting positions, dressing rooms for the actors, um, the ability to get shows in and out quickly, making it uh, accessible for uh, disabilities. So the ADA incorporation, all of these things the building had not done. So I would say those are all the invisible things that make it the best uh, machine for theater it can be. And in addition to that, we, um, I thought about the use of color in, in theaters and um, we found that when this opened up in 1912, it had tapestries on the wall <laughs> that represented a number of, of um, things, including uh, this, this image you see here, which is kind of the, the gods of theater. So we proposed creating a pixelated version of that tapestry and applying that to all of the walls. And if you look here and you look at the back, Go back one, sorry. If you look at the very back of that theater, you can see that it's lighter blue, and then it gets darker and darker and more saturated as it gets to the stage. Well, of course, that's what you want a theater to do. Before the show, you're talking to the audience, you're looking around, but when the show begins, you want your focus just on the storytelling. So the next image shows a detail of the mural, and it is pixelated. Uh, with these custom glyphs we designed. But when you pull the camera back, you see the version of the tapestry. So it's a contemporary representation of a historic piece used in a way to, uh, to uh, focus the audience on, this, on the storytelling. Wow, that is a very smart uh, solution for uh, keeping the historical uh, features and also adding the contemporary Touches. Um, so we've talked about uh, the designs. Um, so now let's talk about let's talk about some uh, management. So we all know we are in a very special times that the COVID nineteen pandemics is happened uh, all over the world. So during this special uh, situation, how to maintain the normal operation of your company? Well, let's start by saying that there is no normal right now. Uh, you know, um, it, it's very not normal. Um, it is, I believe, uh, I, like I said, I'm an optimist. It is a time when designers, um, I think, are most needed. You know, uh, we, we can, as a group, offer creative solutions. Um, so a few things happened. One is, um, you know, we somewhat instantly went towards all remote. Um, my studio has amazing people running the management part of it. Uh, our our uh, technology group is phenomenal. Uh, our financial team and legal team and uh, human resource team all really rallied and we went immediately to remote um, and now, as we start to come back to the office little by little, you know, one of the things I believe is most important, and from day one, uh, we stayed, I have two partners, Sean Sullivan and Greg Keffer, we stayed in close touch with the office to continue to communicate that we have an important mission right now. 
And I think that is, from a management point of view, the most important thing is leadership and emphasizing what our mission is, finding a way for people to continue their work, obviously putting out there to our client base that we're still here and we're still working, the level and scale of problem we're willing to solve are different. Um, we also uh, believe as a studio, giving back is critical. And so starting Dine Out, I think for the whole office was a way to not feel so helpless, was a way to not feel so trapped by, uh, you know, every project we looked at that we designed is about people coming together and celebrating. And that is what was taken away entirely from the world, uh, you know, for good reasons, because we had to learn to be safe. Um, so thinking about how that will evolve, thinking about the future, staying in close communication, um, sharing information, uh, trying to find the ways being in person in our office is important and relevant. One example is uh, we started doing more and more virtual presentations and looking at materials and textures on a Zoom call is just missing something. There's no way to touch it. There's no way to, uh, to express exactly how it changes in the light. So we've uh, modified our office, created you know, very safe um, conditions for people working there. And so slowly but surely we're coming together for those things that require coming together. And those things that are better virtual, we will continue to use in the, in the post-COVID world. Yeah, I just really hope everything's back to normal. <laughs> okay, and, and we know that uh, you have a 250 people's team. So uh, what is the most effective way to uh, run a team for these uh, numbers of people? We, you know, the obvious answer is you have to have really good people. And I think people are attracted by a mission. So you want to have a clear point of view. And then I think you need to, um, you need to have a structure that gives people room to grow, that uh, gives individuals a sense of being part of their team and being part of the bigger whole. Um, and the size of our firm was never a driver or a concern. What was a driver is diversity. So diversity in project types has, has in some ways created this, this uh, reason to create a structure that can grow. And um, so it, the, the, the really the key to that is having a structure where people are empowered. Um, they can collaborate with each other um, but they, as a team, feel like they can make progress and that you continue to get work and do work that takes creative risks, that doesn't repeat itself, and that builds on a real mission. So uh, we know that you have a great team and also you've done the projects all over the world. So how to control the implementation and quality of the global projects? Um, I think one way to do that is in your projects, try to understand what are the most complex elements? What are the things that require the most research and development? And double down on making sure those get done. So uh, I, do, I do find in early stages with clients, defining you know, an idea that can survive budgets, schedules, contractor errors. You know, you need an idea that's strong enough that it can survive all of that. Um, the other part of that solution is we do work globally, um, but we also uh, act very locally. So wherever we're doing work, we will have someone on the ground uh, looking at the level of craftsmanship and um, understanding that uh, that sometimes it's the smallest details that create the biggest impact and the biggest memory. So you can't just tackle a few things. Yeah, that's very, uh, that's very important for the implementation 